You know how many feet there are in a mile? 3,000 something. This is the moment I realized I will never use the metric system. Okay, let's see how, let's, how far you can jump. Ready? My six-year-old is constantly asking me to measure how far he can jump. I have to jump on that. Okay, I'm going to count it. Ready, set, go. And inevitably, this ends up happening. Okay, stay there, stay there. One, two, three. That was two meters. No, it was six. No, remember you got... Oh, six feet. Yeah. Oh, woof. The entire world uses the same measuring system, except for three countries. So you have the richest, most powerful country, and then you have this small African nation that the US kind of invented to like ship slaves back to. It's a weird situation that I made a whole video about. Totally different. And then you have Myanmar, a Southeast Asian country that used to be called Burma. You don't see maps like this very often where the whole world is one color and then you have three random countries peppered across the globe that are a different color. And I'm looking at you, Britain. I know that you're green on this map, but we all know you still kind of dabble in pounds and pints and miles. I want to show you exactly how this happened and show you why I will never use the metric system. If somebody runs a 5K, I have no idea where that translates into miles. A thousand two-step paces of a Roman soldier. We have no reason to be ashamed for using feet and pounds. Now, many calculations are merely a matter of moving the decimal point. It's one of the great things about Americans is we won't change no matter how good it would be for us. Hey, real quick, we'll get back to metric in just a second, but... I need to thank today's sponsor because that's how I run a business so that I can make these videos for you. The sponsor of today's video is NordVPN, which is a brand that has supported this channel for a long time now, and I'm very grateful. A VPN is a thing that sounds really fancy and technical, but it basically just allows you to connect to the internet via a different country. This is useful for a lot of reasons. I've been traveling a lot lately, and I've been able to use NordVPN to connect to my internet via the United States so that all of my Gmail and accounts don't think that I'm like a hacker in a different country. This is very, very useful to me, especially in the world of endless two-factor authentication death loops that I've been in many times when I'm in other countries. It's amazing how a little affordable tool can just fix that. And that's what NordVPN does. Oh, and by the way, it's not some like coding tech boy thing. You just literally press a button and you're like connected to a VPN. It also works the other way. If I'm in the United States and want to connect to the internet via Canada or the UK or India, I suddenly get access to all of the things that Canadians and British people see when they like log on to Netflix. It's pretty cool. Oh, and NordVPN also has this new thing called threat protection, which basically when it's turned on, you can surf the internet and not worry about trackers and malicious ads and malware and all of these things that you just don't want to worry about when you're on the internet. So there's a link in my description. It's nordvpn.com slash Johnny Harris. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you in on an exclusive deal where you can sign up for NordVPN and get four months for free. Oh, and you get 30 days to decide if you are going to use this or not and if it's useful to you and you can get all of your money back if it's not. Pretty good deal. Let's get back to why I will never use the metric system. The first thing humans measured was time. Think of like sun, moon, stars, sundials, constellations. This was pretty easy because we're all looking up at the same night sky. It basically does the same thing every day and every night. Totally reliable and unchanging. Measuring stuff like weight and length is way harder. And for a long time, the best thing we had was our bodies. Humans are about this big. So we've always wanted a unit of measurement about ooh, this long. The earliest unit of measurement that we know of is the cubit, which was basically the length of a forearm. Not super precise because we all have different sized forearms, but it got the job done, at least in the case of building giant pyramids in Cairo or in Noah's Ark, which was apparently 300 of these puppies. Over time, humans needed to measure bigger and longer things. So they began using their daily activities as references, which was mostly just like a lot of farming like the acre, which was the amount of land that a farmer could manage to plow in a day. Or the hundredweight, which was kind of how much a man could carry on his back comfortably. Because, yeah, it's the same for everyone, right? What say you, Cory? More. Wait. So by the 1700s, there was like a billion ways of measuring things. But up here, they had a few popular ones. So you've got the foot, which was, well, the average length of a man's foot. This is a ruler that you always have handy with you. Handy. 
hand foot handy. Right? Should we keep that? <laughs> and then you've got the inch, which in the 1300s was decreed as three grains of barley laid end to end. From the midst of the ear. Right. Who knows what a barley corn is? Super convenient, right? <laughs> Who needs a measuring tape when you could just bring around a little pouch of all your barley corns to measure things with? And then there was the yard, which was like the average measurement around someone's chest. And then King Henry shows up in England and is like, we need to standardize the yard using my body. And for a while there in England, it was King Henry's body, like the length from his nose to his thumb, or like the length of his arm that was used to derive all of these like yard-like measurements. It was his literal body, like that's what they were using. And then there's the mile, which is the distance covered by Roman soldiers walking 1,000 paces. They then somehow discovered that the mile was roughly about eight furlongs. Furlongs, of course, being the distance that a team of oxen could plow without resting. The pound was defined as the weight of 7,000 grains. 6,987, 6,988. <sighs> It's really terrible. What is happening? I mean, all of these measurements seem so tenuous and inconsistent, and they were. 6,999, 7,000. We've got a pound, everyone. We've got a pound. It was madness. <laughs> Meanwhile, down here in France in the late 1700s, they were dealing with their own madness, and it had nothing to do with measurements. At this time, the French were beheading kings and queens, and they were drinking lots of coffee and sitting around in salons doing science things. The people of France wanted to change just about everything, and the measurement systems were not off the table in these discussions. So in the middle of all of this enlightenment, they look at each other and they're like, why the hell are we using our forearms to measure stuff? They needed something precise, not like barley corns and forearms, but something that they could peg their new measurement system to that was an unchanging baseline. How about the literal planet we live on, said the coffee drinking French science guys. We should measure this distance right here and divide it by 10 a bunch of times and get a really precise unit of measure so that we don't have to use our feet and arms. Great idea, but how the hell do you get this massive measurement in 1792? And the answer was this thing plus some math. So these two French astronomers go out into the French countryside looking for mm. high up places like hills or like castle towers. And then they look through this fancy little platinum math telescope and measure the angles between two points out in the distance. This fancy telescope allows them to make this measurement without having to walk these whole distances. And in this way, they could start making little triangles across the French countryside. And then, using some basic math that we all learned in middle school, they could start to calculate a hyper-accurate distance along this straight line. It took them seven years to calculate all of this, but they got it. And once they had this distance, they were able to calculate this distance between the North Pole and the equator, one fourth of the Earth's circumference. So they took this line, this measurement, and they chopped it up into 10 million little parts. And one of those parts is called a meter. Like this is pegged to a real unchanging measurement that is our Earth. I mean, it'll change eventually but not in our lifetimes. The name meter comes from the Greek word metron, which means a measurement, which is just like super literal and precise and exactly what the French enlightenment was all about. Now here's what it's all about, the meter. So now you have this meter, and if you divide this into 100 smaller units, you have a centimeter, centimeter. So put a thousand of these side by side, and you get yourself a kilometer, a kilometer. The best part about the metric system is the time it saves in computation. Wait a minute, I can do this. It's all about tens. So if this measurement was 10 million of these, divide that by a thousand, you get 10,000 kilometers. Okay, so this is 10,000 kilometers. One fourth of the Earth's circumference. Four of these should be 40,000 kilometers. The Earth's circumference is 40,000 kilometers. 
Wait, what? No, I don't want miles. Come on. What? It should be 40,000. What's this extra 75 kilometers doing here? Well, it turns out that one of these French astronomers actually made an error in his calculations, making the final meter about 0.2 millimeters shorter than it should have been. The guy quickly discovered this, like in the middle of it, but he didn't tell anyone because support for this new system was already really tenuous and he didn't want anyone to have any more doubt or skepticism. So it turns out the metric system isn't literally perfect. Take that. Finding this measurement was the hardest part. Now that they have it, they were able to build an entire system purely based off of this. Let me show you. Okay, so now we want a unit for volume. Let's build a hypothetical cube that is 10 centimeters on all sides. You fill it up with liquid and you have a liter, one liter. And from there you can do the same thing that we did with meters, centiliters, kiloliters, you name it. It's all tens, which makes it so much easier to convert between these different measurements. It's a lot easier than barley corns. Okay, so now we have a liter, which is a volume thing. Let's use this to make a unit for mass, AKA weight. I know they're different, but it's like the Earth's gravity makes weight and mass the same when you're written on Earth, blah, blah, blah. I get it, commenters, I see you. I see you typing right now, back off. You fill this liter with water and now you have a kilogram. Divide that by a thousand and you have a gram. Add a thousand kilograms together and you have a metric ton. I mean, it's simple, it's tens, it's hundreds, it's thousands. Now, many calculations are merely a matter of moving the decimal point, not the pencil. Okay, so now they have all these units that are scientific and standardized and founded on concepts of exact measurements. And this is really the first time that humans ever had this. The Frenchmen all looked at each other and like, good work guys, we did it. The coffee helped, this is great. What should we call it? And they settled on... Okay, cool, great system, but why don't I use the metric system? What happened? Well, that has to do with pirates and international politics. So France is like, this system works pretty damn well. We're impressed with ourselves. We should tell the rest of the world, post haste. So it's the late 1700s and France is going around country by country with a literal meter stick being like, hey guys, look what we invented. It's pegged to the earth. It's like literally like we measured this entire thing and you should adopt it because it's really precise. It's gonna make international trade way more efficient. And people were like, oh, this is cool, but like we're a little skeptical. And meanwhile, in France, they were still kind of skeptical. The current leader at the time was this guy, Napoleon. We've all heard about him. And he was super into it. He's like, metric is awesome. You know what else he was into? Making sure everyone liked him. So when he saw that the French public wasn't super jazzed about uprooting what was working for them for like hundreds of years, he decided not to enforce metric by law. So France ended up in this weird limbo for like 30 years. And meanwhile, the US is like looking from across the ocean and they're like, dude, metric, it's a total fad. There's no way, like Napoleon is, is like wishy-washy. There's no way this is actually gonna stick. So let's hold off on the whole metric thing and just industrialize with our very silly system that is built on like people's feet. If the metric system is the tool of the devil, my car gets 40 rods to the hog's head and that's the way I like it. But we'll get back to the US in a minute because there's still hope. In the meantime, France finally gets fully on board and successfully sells not only their public on the metric system, but the world. They're like, come on guys, we sent two dudes out to do trigonometry with their golden telescopes for like seven years for this shit. Trust me, you don't wanna do that on your own. Adopt the system. It was a tough sell at first to get people to switch, but eventually they did. Started with Belgium, then the Netherlands and Luxembourg, then Algeria, a French colony, 20 years later. And then it kind of snowballed from there. Partly because countries realized how rational it was, but partly because Europe was taking over the world at this time and bringing their values and language and systems to every corner of the globe forcibly. <sighs> yes, colonialism will make it into every one of my videos. Okay, but what about the USA? Well, France had some beef with the US at this point. It's kind of a long story, not gonna go into it, but what's important to know is that the US was weirdly put in the middle between this like frenemy bromance gone wrong between France and England. So at first, America wasn't invited to the inner circle to be introduced to metric, but as the world was adopting metric, France finally decided to send a guy over to deliver this, a prototype of the almighty ultralogical kilogram inviting the US to join the rest of the world in this measurement revolution. There is hope for the USA to go metric. 
So this French ship is sailing across the Atlantic with the kilogram on board, and a storm hits it and blows it into the Caribbean, where it runs into a group of British pirates. The British pirates capture the emissary from France, they imprison him, and they try to gain ransom from France for this guy. Well, they end up accidentally killing the French guy, but they notice that he has a package, and the pirates are like, oh shit. This is addressed to the U.S. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. Mm. Us Brits are cool with the U.S. right now, so let's bring this over to New York and deliver it. Super courteous pirates. I like these guys. But when they get to New York, Thomas Jefferson isn't the Secretary of State anymore. So they just hand it to the guy who is now the Secretary of State, Edmund Randolph. And Randolph's like, what the hell is this weird hunk of copper? So then he gives it to this other guy who just keeps it. <laughs> So yeah, thanks to geopolitics and pirates, the US didn't get the kilo in time to convince them to maybe adopt France's new super logical system of measurement. Britain also refused for a long time, sticking with the system that was developed using some dude's foot, but eventually they got on board. But not fully, they still dabble in some weird old imperial ways. But get this, they've changed some of the imperial things since the US became independent. Like their pint, which is like 25% bigger than the pint here. They're both called the pint, but go get a pint of beer in the UK and you're actually getting four ounces more than you would in the US. As if having one highly illogical, unreliable measuring system, including feet and teaspoons, isn't bad enough, there are now two of them floating around that have the same names. It gets real bad when you look at the ounce, which is a word that is used to define several different units of mass, weight, or volume. Same word, bunch of different things. Okay, okay, but how hard can this be? This is my home turf, this is my measurement system. I got this. So an ounce in the UK is 1 20th an imperial pint. That seems nice and easy. That's 160th of an imperial gallon, approximately. That's approximately 28.41 milliliters. Kind of gross. Okay, that's the imperial fluid ounce used in the UK. Okay, so then the US ounce is 1 16th of a US liquid pint, which is 128th of a liquid gallon, which is exactly 29.57352956252 milliliters, making it about 4.08% larger than the imperial fluid ounce used in the UK. Okay, but wait, this is just the fluid ounce. What about the weight ounce? The one that came from like the 7,000 grains to be a pound? So it's 7,000 grains to a pound and there's 16 ounces to that pound. So that's 437.5 grains to an ounce. But if I wanna convert the weight ounce to the fluid ounce, I just need to multiply the volume by 1.043176 times the density of the ingredient or material so that we can easily switch between the fluid ounce and the weight ounce and the pound with the 700,000 grains and 16th, there's 1 16th of a pound is the ounce the grains are 437.5. Just convert it with uh, Google <clears throat> and you got it. Just super easy. <sighs> yeah, that's where we're at. It's a total mess. You know how many feet there are in a mile? 3,000 something. Every country on earth adopted the metric system eventually besides these three countries. The US, Myanmar, and Liberia. The United States just gave the rest of the world big fingers and f no metric system. Over the years, the US has attempted really formally to go metric. Like in the 70s and 80s, there was all these debates and there was boards created by the government to find a way to like migrate over to metric. But of course, Ronald Reagan shut it down because of, you know, that whole government spending thing. This was an actual public debate. Like this documentary I keep showing was from a like PSA trying to convince people to like get on board with metric. And then on the other side, in the 80s, there was this anti-metric group. Yes, anti-metric groups, that was a thing. They even hosted a gala where they featured the most beautiful foot contest. Don't you just love American culture? Just love to stick it to people. Just look at us being individuals in our own way. But this stuff actually matters, okay? In 1999, NASA sent a satellite to Mars and it went off course and burned up in the planet's atmosphere all because of a misconversion between units of measure. One of the contractors was using Imperial units while NASA ground was using metric and it ended up costing NASA $125 million. But what's interesting is that the US has kind of secretly, quietly got on board with metric, but it's just sort of behind the scenes in boring sectors that none of us really think about and that don't actually make it into all of our intuitions. It's like industry or the federal government or like nutrition labels. I don't look at nutrition labels, but if I did, I would see grams and milligrams. And on liquid-based things, I would see milliliters. 
because nutrition labels are in metric. It doesn't matter that I don't really know what a gram or a kilogram or a milligram even is, but when I go to the pharmacy, the pharmacist gives me my medicine in milligrams. Progress. So yeah, it's pharmaceuticals, it's nutrition, it's film, it's tools, it's bicycles, it's running races. Oh, and for some reason, this one highway sign in Arizona. For all of these efforts, none of them have succeeded in getting metric into the brains of everyday people like me. And this is why I will never use the metric system. I can't, I literally cannot. You don't realize how your intuition is calibrated in certain systems of measurements until you try to change it. I started traveling in my early 20s, really for the first time abroad. And I saw them using metric and I saw how easy it was and how rational it was. And I made a commitment to myself. I'm like, I'm gonna change from my imperial intuition to adopting metric. And I even swore like, I'm going to teach my future children metric from an early age. And since then, over a decade, I have been trying. I look at his distance and to me, oh, that's 10 meters away, not 30 feet. Oh, it feels like it's 20 degrees Celsius outside right now. I would say. Oh yeah, it's like uh, five kilometers down the road. Oh, I'm gonna pick up two kilos of short rib to make the soup tonight. But my dirty little secret is that I've totally been faking it. 10 meters doesn't mean anything to me. What it means is 30 feet divided by three. What I've really been doing this whole time is intuitively estimating things based on the system I know, which is pegged to farming activities and body parts, and then doing the rough math based on the numbers I know about converting to metric. Without those conversion numbers, I honestly cannot estimate what 50 meters looks like. I can't grasp what running five kilometers feels like. I don't know what 22 centimeters is outside of the context of a one foot long ruler that I know is 30 centimeters. And so I'll never use the metric system. I don't know how, and I can't teach myself. I've tried. But then I had kids. There is hope, the next generation. I vowed to instill them with metric intuition and found that it's basically been impossible because everything they're exposed to, at school, in math, on road trips while we're driving, all of it is in feet and miles and cups and pints and teaspoons and tons. I mean, I try, I, I tell my kid measurements in like meters and my six year old will literally respond with, well, how far is that in feet? He is six. Like, this isn't happening. The ship has sailed on changing to metric here in the US for everyday people. It'll likely never happen. I'm trapped in a system that was developed using people's body parts and farming activities and King Henry's arm. We interrupt this film to bring you a special bulletin from Metric News. As America moves toward the metric system, the last holdouts have been seen finally switching over. Soon, it is predicted, the whole world will be unified under this easier system of measurement.